To diplomats of a conventional cast, the arrival of Donald Trump on the world scene was an outrage. Charming to autocrats and occasionally abusive to allies, Trump has ploughed his own furrow, so much so that even traditionally minded Republicans wonder what damage might result if the American people choose to re-elect him. One time around, I think people can understand this is a populist nationalist moment, not just in the United States, but in other countries. Um, but if the greatest country on earth does this twice, then I think it's, uh, it really does affect how people view us. But the other thing is, I mean, there are consequences for how the United States behaves in the world. And I think in a second Trump term, you would see even more of the uh, unilateral kind of behavior, the disdain for allies, uh, the desire to cut deals with really problematic regimes that you've seen before. President Trump doesn't like alliances. He prefers dealing with other nations one to one. How damaging has that been to multilateral cooperation? Well, last year there was a cabinet meeting here in which I've heard the foreign secretary at the time said that NATO would be unlikely to survive a second Trump term. But of course, the Trump years have included foreign policy and security successes, from the overwhelming of ISIS, temporarily at least, to the normalization of relations between Israel and some Gulf Arab states. And there's been a rearguard action against more assertive rivals, even if it's had to come from other members of the Trump administration. The immensely important shift in US policy in confronting the aggression of the Chinese Communist Party. I think that's going to be a multi-generational policy that has very, very strong bipartisan support. I mentioned on Russia, the Trump administration in its actions confronted Russia significantly, not just with sanctions, uh, but also with providing defensive capabilities to Ukraine, for, for example, uh, and, and many other measures that were, that were put in place. Of course, as you mentioned, and as we discussed, you know, the, the, the president's public statements were, were unhelpful. So that presidential voice, so often strident, inconsistent or mocking, has not played out in quite the same way internationally as at home. And in confronting big issues, such as trade with China, those who've been present in negotiations argue America's aims under Trump have not been radically different. What we have seen is that what they want to actually achieve in these negotiations whether they are with China or Japan or the European Union, the, the core national objective have more or less remained the same. And the objection that the United States have with the World Trade Organization are basically constant. So the complaints are more or less unchanged. The only thing that really changed is actually just table manners. I mean, I highly appreciate civility, manners, and the ability to build allies. But the question is, what do you need them for? You know what Kim Jong-un in North Korea said when I talked like I just did about him? He said, Joe Biden is a rabid dog and should be beaten to death with a stick. That's the highest compliment I've gotten in a long time from a thug. Now the campaign is in its final phase, Democrats and anti-Trump Republicans alike remind the public of his reluctance to confront dictators and evangelize for Western values. But with the possibility of a Joe Biden presidency strengthening, they also acknowledge that the US election won't change governments overseas and a simple return to a pre-Trump foreign policy is impossible. The world is more dangerous, more divided. Strong men are on the rise. Our alliances are frayed, and it makes the world much more dangerous place. And rebuilding it is going to be difficult. We've abdicated the world stage for four years. Others have stepped up into it. The Europeans have stepped up to it. Germany has stepped up to it. Uh, but you've also got China building its massive Belt and Road Initiative. You've got President Putin increasingly influential around the world. And America's leadership is, is needed, and only America can fill that role. I will join the Paris Accord because with us out of it, look what's happening. It's all falling apart. 
The Biden campaign insists that their man would move swiftly to revitalize alliances and restore international confidence in US leadership. For example, rejoining the Paris Climate Change Accord and trying to revive the Iran nuclear deal. But the fundamentals in seeking to avoid new foreign wars or contesting trade policy with China will not change, even if the language does. The point that I would make is don't underestimate the importance of tone. You know, the fact that you have the United States, which behaves like a normal ally, uh, which does not seem to be in the grip of, of somebody who themselves has kind of lost their grip, um, is going to be a very big deal and it'll be profoundly reassuring because the, you know, the, the Biden team is basically the old uh, Obama team, uh, some extent the people around Hillary Clinton, plus they'll probably bring in a few of the never Trump uh, Republicans. And I expect what they'll do is you'll have a whole bunch of those, those folks together with people who are clearly surrogates going to capitals all over the world, uh, you know, from Canberra, Tokyo, London, um, Brasilia, you name it, and saying, look, uh, the old United States is back. As for the UK, the current crews of the Queen Elizabeth carrier jointly operating American and British jets underlines long-standing defense and intelligence cooperation. But Joe Biden's shot across the bows about respecting the Anglo-Irish agreement in Brexit has shown that Boris Johnson would be unwise to take a US trade deal for granted. So how will the outcome affect the message coming from the US Embassy in London? Well, whether it's a Trump or Biden presidency, the negotiations for a free trade deal with the US are likely to be tough. But of course, President Trump had sympathy with Brexit in a way that Joe Biden doesn't. Indeed, the challenger has shown that he highly values European unity and the sanctity of the Good Friday Agreement in Ireland. I think there was a callous disregard for the Good Friday Agreement in the UK's decision to, to exit um, the European Union, the way they have handled Brexit, the chaos that surrounded it, and frankly, disregarding the commitments of the Good Friday Agreement. Um, they, I was very involved in the Irish peace process under President Clinton, and it matters what uh, is upheld in the Good Friday Agreement. And the, the, the fact that they would go through this process over years and not have an answer to what is happening to the border between North and South is just frankly irresponsible. It needs to be solved. There cannot be a violation of the Good Friday Agreement. That then underlines that while there may be more civility, a hard-headed assessment of US interests will define the next administration's foreign policy. But along with it, there's an understanding in the wider world America's ability to define events is slowly diminishing.